welcome. Uh, I'm Nikki Vazu and I am a third year and um, my collaborators are from University of Nottingham and we have been working on using refinement types and here liquid Haskell to do resource uh, analysis and that's why this cute title describes our work that I distributed to Graham Hutton. Uh, so in this talk I'm going to talk about insertion sort. So here I'm starting with the basic insert function. It is written in Haskell. It takes uh, an element x that is ORT. It takes a list of x's uh, that is sorted and puts x in the right place in the list. So I define it using Haskell syntax recursively. I say if the list is empty, then I return a singleton list. And then otherwise, I am comparing against the head of the list. If x is smaller, then I'm good, because y wise is already sorted. Otherwise, I recursively, I, I hold y at the beginning and recursively call uh, my insert function. So uh, we can use refinement types to describe <coughs> many properties of this insert function. So for example, here I am giving insert a refinement type that talks about length preservation. It says that uh, the result list that they call uh, outputs, OVOS, uh, is refined so that the length of my result list is equal to one plus the length of my input list. So I'm using refinement types to refine the Haskell type and um, talk about properties. Here I'm talking about length. Um, later we'll see that I can talk about sortedness. And the question that I am addressing in this talk is can I use refinement types like this to talk about the resources that the function uh, needs. And here, by resources, I'm going to mean the number of comparisons that I'm doing. So uh, insert does comparison when I am here to decide if the, um, the ordering between x and y. So what I would like to do is how many times I reach uh, this comparison. So intuitively, I, I want to write something like this. Uh, that says that, OK, insert returns the list os. And also, this computation has a cost. This computation, let's call it output, has a cost that is bounded by the length of x's, right? And what is this uh, o? Now it's nothing. N nowhere in the signature I'm bounding o. Uh, but I can use this tick uh, data type uh, that what I'm doing basically is I am taking the insert computation and I am wrapping this result in this tick data type. Uh, I call my result tick O and then here O is within bound. So I can say the cost of O, where now O is my ticked result, is bounded by the length uh, of x's. So let's go and see what is this tick. Uh, tick is a Haskell data type defined very uh, cleanly. Uh, it is parametric. It takes any type variable A, so I can define tick on any A's. And it has two fields. It has the value field that uh, holds the A that I'm returning. And also it has a cost uh, that is a natural number. And it is basically capturing the resources that I need to generate the value A. So this is my data type. and tick is an applicative. Uh, so applicative has two functions. It has a pure function that lifts. So I take a value and I put it inside the tick. So what I'm doing is I am uh, giving it zero cost. So if x is of some type a, I am lifting, I am putting it inside the tick with zero cost. And I am generating a tick that is refined so that it has cost exactly zero. And also, the other applicative method uh, is uh, the apply to combine ticked uh, values. So if I have a ticked function with cost i, and this function value is f, and then I have a second ticked function uh, with cost j and a value x, and what I'm doing to uh, uh, apply them, basically I'm collecting the cost. I have that the cost of my application is the cost of i and uh, j, and then my value is the function application of these two results. And then I give it a refinement type uh, that says that if your first, uh, your function argument is f, that f is a ticked function, and the argument argument is x, 
then the cost of this application is uh, the cost to compute the argument and the cost to compute the function f. It's clear? Okay, so I define my tick data type. I define the applicative instance. So now I can go back to my insert. I can go back to my insert function and make uh, something that actually Haskell type checks. So I uh, say that insert returns a ticked computation and I am using queues and applicative <coughs> instance uh, methods to lift my result computation into the tick uh, data type. So uh, in my base case, I don't have any cost. So I use pure and remember pure returns the value with zero cost. And then in my adaptive case, uh, <coughs> I again need to lift. Uh, so the only thing that I have at hand right now is pure. So I am lifting using pure, and then uh, to do the recursive call, insert is already ticked. Uh, so I also need to lift my cons, and this has the type checks. And actually it refinement type checks in the sense that the cost of this operation is always bounded by the length of exit. But the problem is that the cost of these computations is always zero. Okay, uh, so let's go and see how we actually can uh, track resources. So instead of the applicative instances, I have two functions, step and my other apply, that actually manipulate resources. So step is very similar to uh, pure. It takes a pure uh, argument x and it puts it in inside the t. But now I am ticking. I am increasing uh, the step by, uh, I'm increasing my resources by one. And then I have a variant of the apply. Its signature is the same, but uh, I am combining a ticked function f with a ticked argument x. But now I am adding one to the cost of this computation. So it's like apply, but I have this plus one so that I can use it when I am actually making an application that increases my resources by one. So now we can use this step and apply um, functions to actually go and increase uh, the resources. So in my base case, I'm still pure. I don't have any comparison. And in my uh, inductive cases, I am doing one comparison. So here I did the comparison I used step. And here I did the comparison, and this is the type of I need to use this function that combines my two results and increases by one. So with these uh, uh, operations that are actually tracking resources, I can go and increase and combine my resources uh, that I manually used, and I can still decide that um, the cost of insert, so the actual comparisons that I made, are bounded by the length. Okay, so let's now go and use this and see how we can use them to do insert sort. So uh, the code is getting bigger, so I'm going to use my editor. And here is the insert function that I presented be uh, before. So uh, the definition is the same. The definition is the same as before. Um, uh, every time I am making a comparison, I am tra tracing the resources either with step or with this um, application function. And the type signature is more or less like before. It says that the result is a tick O, which, uh, whose cost is bounded by the length of axis. And here we can see that I am also using refinement types to describe more properties. For example, I am using list orderedness. This all list is Haskell list defined to be sorted. So this refinement type specifies both uh, resources, uh, sortedness, and also it says that the length of the result is equal to uh, one plus the length of my input. And uh, so what are these ticks? I define them in a Haskell library that is imported in insertion sort, and they're exactly like I saw you. So it's a Haskell data type, that has a cost and a value, and the cost is defined to be a natural number. And then I am defining the instances that I, I presented for applicative 
and then I have the resource tracking function steps and apply and then uh, I have also uh, monadic instances for return and bind for example bind takes a ticked argument um, uh, a function that goes from a to a ticked uh, b and it combines them properly to return a ticked b so let's go and use these uh, operators to define insertion sort. Uh, so, insertion sort says, uh, okay, it says if I am in the base case, then I am returning a pure computation, uh, that's the empty list. Otherwise, I am inserting, I am recursively calling to insert axes, and then I bind the result uh, to insert of x. And um, what the, the type specification says, says that it returns a tick uh, that contains an order list whose length <coughs> is the same as the length of x's. And the cost of this is bounded by um, length of x's squared. Okay? And you see this arrow here that basically says that liquid Haskell that I am uh, using to check the specifications cannot prove this property. So it cannot prove the resource property uh, <coughs> that I am specifying here. And the reason is that, uh, so if you see the type of bind, it says that, um, okay, so the type of bind says that take the ticked argument, take the monadic computation that co computes the result, and then it says that the cost of this bind is equal to the cost of the input x and this is like kind of it is getting into like evaluation of dependent typing it says that uh, I have to add the cost of my function when it is applied to the value of uh, the argument and this is kind of this computation is over here is, is very complicated to get evaluated statically and this is why Liquid Haskell is telling you I cannot uh, check that this holds. So, and this is because it's very difficult to compute the cost of the result of n. So, what we're going to do is we're going to define a bounded bind function that is bounded by an integer like argument, an integer extra argument that we give it. So, we define a bounded bind that says take uh, the monadic argument, take the function m, but then this function m, uh, when computed, its result is bounded by this n argument that you gave. So now uh, you cannot call the bounded bind. Every time you call the bounded bind, you have to specify concretely um, the resources that the second argument is going to use. And then with this specification, we know that the result of bind is bounded with the cost to compute the first argument and also n that approximates the second argument. Okay? Okay, so let's go back to insert sort and let's going to use bounded bind uh, to make uh, the refinement type check the resources. So I'm using bounded bind with some n and then I am binding in the recursive call with insert. <coughs> and now the question is what is this n? what uh, do I have to buy, uh, what is the resources that I have to use. And we said that this n is the upper bound uh, that the second argument, the insert function, is going to use. And if we go and check uh, the type of the insert function, we see that it says, its specification says, that its result needs at most length axis resources. So I can come and say that Okay, here I need at most length um, access resources. And now with this help, uh, I can go and check that the resources that are used are required for insertion sort is insertion sort are as specified um, <coughs> length x squared. Okay. Okay, <coughs> so we bounded uh, the resources used by ISORT and then uh, we can use uh, this computation 
to give bounds to every client of uh, insertion show. So for example, here I am defining a minimum function that takes as input uh, a list of A's, uh, uh, where A is ordered, and it returns its minimum element. And since I already have uh, sorting, the way to compute this minimum function is I am taking the head of the sorted function, and then I need to lift everything inside the um, tick monad. So I'm lifting the head using pure, and then I am applying um, to the ticked uh, sortedness. And because I know exactly the resources required by sortedness, I can prove easily that the cost for minimum is bounded by length axis square. Okay. Um, any questions? <coughs> is is the, uh, the the bounded the, the, the bounded bind is it checked at runtime or something? Because if I'm if I'm right, you're only uh, telling this the, the type checker that it's that it's bounded by it. Yes. Or is it somehow checked that it's actually see. not larger? If I do minus one, for example, I say no. Like this is where it is checked. Yeah. When I am using it, I get this error here. You see mm -hmm. the red line. So the yeah, bounded bind has cool. an argument. It, it is like its type assumes that it takes an end that bounds the, the resources required by the second argument. And then when you are using it, I, I am checking that the resources required by the second argument are exactly this end. So now that I made it wrong, ah, exact, I get. Exactly, the thing. not, not, not so they're, they're bound. smaller. They're smaller. They are Small smaller okay. because that is what I specified here. At the type, I'm saying that the cost is less than or equal to n, where n is my first argument. So when I am using it, like here, it, this, this is checked. And now that it's wrong, I get an error. Yes? Related to that, I mean, all the information uh, that, that these uh, bounds are correct, they can be checked at compile time, so we don't ever actually need to compute the length of, of those lists, right? I mean, we don't, during, during runtime, we never, we, we would never use that, that, yes. that value. So is GHC clever enough to optimize it all the way? No, no GHC doesn't know okay. anything about liquid Haskell yet. Be because that's that's kind of the, the nice thing about mm. liquid Haskell, that you don't need to mm. modify anything at, at, at runtime. Yes. Do you have an idea of how to get? I think uh, you can use some metaprogramming template Haskell to uh, remove <coughs> all the yeah. ticks. Okay. And mm -hmm. I mean, uh, everything is defined in the library, mm -hmm. so you don't have to export it. So, like, you can guarantee in the library definitions yeah. that everything is erasable. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it is stupid to actually go. But the other thing is that all the cost will never used. So maybe it is smart enough not to actually go mm -hmm. and do the computations because yeah. of laziness. Yeah, yeah. Could you show what happens if you give it length plus one? That is still. Oh, true? ah, plus one. Let's see. I don't, mm, yeah. Because, because doesn't that mess yeah. up something as well? Because. Uh, sure. Does this hold though? <coughs> Because this information is used to prove the, uh, the cost. Maybe plus one is not strong enough. But if you say something like this, no, that is correct. So bind checks. Uh, but so we need to put the, um, here a value so that bind checks, so that like this bounds uh, insert, it's like higher than insert. And also, it's low enough to to enforce the cost. But what happens, for example, if you do length times length? So, so just just to break. Uh, mm -hmm. the yes. Yeah. 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 No. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, what if I want to track more than one resource? Do I just nest one tick inside another, or? I mean. I haven't thought about that. I mean, my direct response would be to define a different tick that has two costs. 
but maybe you can nest them too. I tried nesting them with uh, monadic computations and it is not straightforward because you need to define the monad transformers. Right, and I, I would expect this to be painful, so um, that's, uh, that's why I'm asking like what's a, like a canonical way of dealing with this. Yeah, um, and I mean I'm using uh, uh, the cost <coughs> as an integer uh, because like the liquid Haskell asks to the SMT questions to decide everything and SMT knows integers. Uh, but uh, maybe you could use like a different number, like a different representation of your resources. For example, a pair of integers or something like that. Yes. What happens if your I'm new to this. What happens if your refinement times are wrong? You get this. Uh, no, I mean not wrong in terms of type checking, but if you do length times length times length, you no know, cube, then you know, the bounds. And so you got. I mean, that's going to be pretty hard to debug. Yes, yeah, that's a very big question. Like, how do you move the, the specifications from your mind to uh, the refinement types? Uh, yeah, I mean, usually then you are going to use it at some point and you will understand that something. Is, for example, in mean, you don't expect to go before uh, above quadratic. So maybe, like, you have to trace back and do, like, the verification from the beginning. minimum uh, is quadratic, uh, but this is not true um, <coughs> because Haskell is lazy. Uh, so it is like it is not going to do the hot computation. Uh, so what Haskell is going to do if I remove the ticks is uh, to compute head, it is going to lazily go and sort uh, the list. So it is just going to figure out the first element and it's not going to do the full sorting. And uh, this is not capture uh, in the tick data type because my applicative is forcing evaluation of everything. So if you want to do like um, lazy uh, structures, you have to um, define lazy lists. And I mean, this is a little bit complicated, but uh, it makes sense. Uh, so like, um, a lazy list basically pulls computation and the tick data types inside the definition. So I'm saying that the lazy list, again, is parametric with respect to A's, and it can be either empty or it is a cons of a head A and the tail. But now I don't want to go and force the evaluation of tail. But what I do is that I'm saying that the tail is a tick that contains lazy lists. So when I am constructing using cons a lazy list, uh, I am not going to evaluate the tail. I'm just saying that tail is a tick. And then again, I can refine uh, my uh, lazy list data structures. And I am refining them using like a technique that we have in liquid Haskell, we call it abstract refinement types, to, to say that the lazy lists are parametric with respect to a predicate P. And then we use this predicate, we instantiate this predicate to, to define lists, uh, ordered lists. So we say that an ordered lazy list um, is a lazy list so that its head every time is less than or equal to the tail. And so again, we define this in a library and then we can go and, and define um, <coughs> sortedness using lazy, lazy lists. So for example, here I have insertion sort. Um, before insertion sort, I have insert on lazy list. And uh, let's say, give me an element x, give me an ordered lazy list A, and I'm going to return back a ticked computation that returns ordered list, and now its cost is one. It is bounded by one. Why? Because if I have my base case nil, I just return uh, a cons, and then if I have a cons list, then again, like the previous insert, I compare the first two elements, and now I am stepping both times, because I am making access a step. But now the recursive call is not accumulated. The cost of the recursive call is not accumulated because the, the recursive call, the, the return list says I am a cons um, with uh, my head. And then you do the bind inside the tail when you want to make the computation. So now uh, I am lazily inserting. I have a cost that is constant. It is uh, one. So again, I can just use the bounded bind 
to define insertion sort. Uh, again, as before, base case I return, zero cost, otherwise I am bounded, but now with one, because my late insert has cost uh, one, and I am, I am doing the recursive call at most length x times, so now my cost to insert lazily is uh, length x. So now with this uh, let's insert, if I want to take the minimum, I have cost that is bounded by the length of x's. That is what actually uh, lazy GHC, um, lazy Haskell is going to do. So uh, this is linear. Uh, the applicative is um, uh, accumulating my two costs. And now I have the actual, um, uh, the actual uh, resources that are required by minimum that are bounded by the length mm -hmm. of access. Okay. Um, okay. So let's uh, forget about laziness. So, sorry, can I ask a question? So, uh, that, I mean, about the production. What about the space? Mm. Uh, so, so I am tracking resources manually. Mm. So you can track whatever resources you want. So uh, in my benchmark, uh, uh, I have like fold and fold prime, and I can prove that they use like different space, different tanks. But uh, I mean, the difficulty is, as, as we said before, it's difficult to say, to increase your resources. So if you know like when you're generating a tank, you can go and say it, and then Liquid Haskell is going to help you to approximate this, all these, or to reason about all these resources statically. But it is not responsible that you track the resources correctly. Okay. Mm. How much time? Uh, yeah, um, in four minutes you have ten minutes left. <laughs> I have ten minutes. Oh, okay, <laughs> I have fourteen <laughs> minutes <laughs> doing the math. Okay. Uh, so, um, okay. So you can use Liquid Haskell to do all this refinement type checking, and then you can use it to do something. Um, uh, more fancy that is basically equational reasoning and this is used when you want to prove properties uh, that cannot be proved automatically by the SMT, by the solver that we have at the end. So for example here I have um, imported the insertion, in insertion sort that we defined before and I am expressing here a property using a refinement of a Haskell function prop that says give me a list x's and this list is ordered uh, and non-negative, and what I want to prove is that since this list is ordered, then the cost of insertion of this ordered list is exactly length x is minus one. Yeah. <coughs> okay, and we are going to do this uh, using basically Haskell. I'm going to define like right now. Liquid Haskell says I cannot prove uh, that prop has this refinement type. So what we are going to do is we are going to define. Uh, uh, proof using prop that this theorem holds. So I am going to copy and paste uh, the theorem as the definition of prop. Uh, and I have also imported this proof combinators library that is giving me the proof type, that's basically a unit type, and it is giving me some equational reasoning operators like this equal equal dot and this QED and it is letting me do theorem proving in Haskell. So uh, this claims that this is the proof and Liquid Haskell says I cannot prove this equality and so what I'm going to do as if I was doing uh, a paper and pencil proof is I'm going to split cases and I am saying say that X is, is the empty list uh, so in the case that X is, is the empty list Liquid Haskell can't prove that this holds. But then I have the case that X is not the empty list. So again, it says I cannot prove this right here. So if it is not the empty list, then it is a cons. And I am copying and pasting. And now, <coughs> basically, it will still complain, but I have to persuade Liquid Haskell that this equality holds. So what do I do? I go and start doing rewriting. So uh, I sort is basically we defined as the bound bind of length axis uh, with 
um, I sort axis and then insert X and um, so liquid Haskell can prove this step but then we still need to uh, uh, continue our rewriting so the cost of a bind is equal to the cost of the first computation uh, plus plus the cost of insert x to the value that sorting returns. And again, it likes this, the, uh, this step. It doesn't like the next step. Uh, so we start, we continue rewriting. Uh, <coughs> so now I want to insert x to the value of I sort axis, right? But I know from the specification that axis is a sorted list. So I have below a theorem that says, I haven't proved, but, it, uh, but you can prove it in the same style, but says that if you have axis, and axis is a sorted list, uh, then axis is equal to the value of sorting axis. And this theorem is called sorted uh, equality. So what I can do is I can say here that uh, because of this theorem, if I call it on axis, then I can go and rewrite uh, the value. Let's see. Then I can go and rewrite all this part with axis because of this theorem. Mm. Okay and it still likes it, but I cannot prove my last. And what do I do next? Um, I want to evaluate the uh, cost of either of axis, and I know that it is length axis minus one, so I'm calling my induct inductive hypothesis on axis, and if this is equal to length axis minus one, and then, because axis is sorted, um, inserting of x in a sorted list, I think has cost one, and hopefully liquid has still no. So it's like this, it is complaining here uh, because it says that props preconditions are uh, not satisfied by axes. And this is because I have said that uh, the property takes only lists whose length is greater than zero. So if axes could be a list with zero length, so I need to split a different case where um, the list has exactly one element, right? And let's see if this, uh, if it can figure out the details. So the more cases I'm splitting, the slowest verification becomes. But it is very slow. Oh, okay. So yeah, it had like uh, two errors. One said that X is, it cannot prove that X is, is non empty, but I added a case that were uh, the input list has exactly one element, so I know that axis has at least one element, and it proved that. And also it was complaining about this step, because it couldn't prove that the cost of insert x axis is one, which also like is satisfied if axis has at most one element. So uh, the uh, lines are gone, and we used liquid Haskell to prove uh, that if I am going to sort a sorted list, then uh, the cost is exactly equal to length axis minus one. And we use, uh, we use this, like, it's called extrinsic uh, way of proving, because like, you can use refinement types to encode arbitrary theorems, and then you use your Haskell functions 
to prove them. And once you go in that uh, mode, uh, you can actually go and encode arbitrary properties. For example, here I have an other interesting property. I am saying that if I have a sorted list x's, and then a list y's whose length is exactly equal to the length of x's, then I can prove uh, that um, the cost of sorting the sorted list x's is always less than or equal of the cost of sorting the unsorting list y's. And what is interesting is that in this proof, I am using the property of mean i sort that we proved before, where I'm using the property that uh, uh, sorting the sorted list is bounded. And then I have another theorem that basically says that this bound that we proved before uh, uh, the upper is the upper bound of sorting the list. So combining these two information, SMT, uh, I mean, Liquid Haskell using SMT is smart enough to combine the information and prove uh, relational properties about a resource of Haskell functions lifted uh, inside the tick moment. So, mm, we define insert sort, and uh, this is like the conclusion. Um, we use refinement types to do resource tracking, and the high level idea is that we define this tick monad that track all the resources that are user-defined resources. They are tracked at a runtime. And then I'm using refinement types to approximate proper bound for these tracked resources. And we saw at the beginning that the problem is that if you do that, then you become like, you use fancy um, types. For example, you need to evaluate how a ticked function operates on arguments. And then we define this bound, uh, bounded bind operator that helps um, bounding the functions that you're going to use. And you can either use this e-bind operator and using what we say uh, ghost variables to bound the resources that you're going to use, or you can go uh, use extrinsic proofs as we proved before, and then you become very expressive, but you need to uh, define the proofs yourself as Haskell functions. And yes, these extrinsic proofs can uh, define arbitrary relational properties. And these are some benchmarks that we did. So we did lazy, uh, lazy data structures. We did a lot of relational properties. Uh, we defined properties of data types. And these properties are basically optimization properties. So for example, if you uh, do map fusion, you get like um, uh, better, um, you get a better uh, run times. And then apart from insertion short, we used um, this technique uh, to bound so, uh, the resources used by merge sort, quick sort, and it is very interesting sorting function. And with this, I want to thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much for your talk. And yeah, there are still a few minutes left for questions. Uh, so uh, now in Haskell you can use um, proper dependent types, I would say, and these refinement types, which are also a bit dependent, as I understood it. Um, what, what's the future there? Can you somehow use that together? What's like the, the next version of the pollute the going to be? Is it um, um, either or, or can you com combine them to get, I don't know, um, the um, advantage of uh, automatic mm, stuff from liquid Haskell and maybe uh, the um, power of dependent types which you don't ha have fully in liquid Haskell, right? This would be great. Uh, I know it's not the next version of Prelude. <laughs> 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 uh, I hope it was. Uh, but uh, I mean, the idea is what you said, right? That um, uh, Haskell is pushing to express uh, to uh, increase expressiveness of dependent types. And what we have is uh, the automation of SMT. And it is not like fully clear how to combine these two because it's different logics, because SMT is using classical logic. So uh, I don't know what unsoundness we can get if we like just combine them. But I know that it would be ideal if these two were combined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, can I question this? closely related. Um, so has this gone beyond uh, research demos and the proofs of concept, meaning is, um, is liquid Haskell being used um, 
in some project. Uh, so that's one question, and like a underlying question is what about maintainability? Meaning, um, it seems like there's um, this requires some well boilerplate, especially like you can find some definitions. I can imagine that if you change your definitions, you suddenly have to rewrite all your proofs that have these definitions in mind, and that becomes painful. So I'm curious, um, how does that look? So, I mean, uh, Liquid Haskell is very powerful at uh, these decidable domains, not like this fancy com I mean, I if you uh, have like, if you have very concrete specifications that are decidable, then Liquid Haskell is very strong at it. And it has been used uh, to have specifications about the byte string library that it's very critical because like then you go like at the memory so you want like an interface that says that you are not going to violate the memory and it, it was also in this setting it was used for optimizations because byte string like has some unsafe functions that go and violate the memory and it has some wrappers that do runtime checks to encode inbound indexing so like um, they used Liquid Haskell to basically get rid of these runtime checks while staying uh, safe. And this was a very uh, nice application. It was It is used in production code. Other than that, I'm not fully uh, aware who else is using it. Um, <coughs> and maintainability of Liquid Haskell or of your code? Well, of, of, of the code that uses um, Liquid Haskell. So if I'm faced with if I'm changing my definitions and I'm faced with updating my proofs, I can imagine uh, this, um, this becomes painful, which is probably not like unique to Liquid This is Haskell. a little bit better than comments. Okay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, it is, I mean, Liquid Haskell is using comments for GT, and so, I mean, you have seen comments that are outdated, so mm -hmm. I think it is good that you have to maintain them. Uh, but I know it's more effort, and this is uh, where I am posting. Like, use SMT to reduce this effort. Yeah? Sorry, no, I missed something, but uh, Spartans do. Tick is a regular thing to have. Mm -hmm. uh, so, no, nobody works. Uh, me from an uh, equating uh, result is a euro for. So, it's up to the discipline for actually uh, nothing works in the context of the uh, right? Yes. That's correct. Like the diff is a data type, and uh, it is just counting the steps that you have specified. And it is totally up to the user to properly uh, step every time a resource is increased. Uh, can it be actually be uh, can it be actually solved by, uh, for example, hiding the constructor of uh, the tick? Ah, can it be solved by hiding the constructor of tick? Um, Yes, that is a very good uh, observation, but um, the thing is that if you saw in the proofs, I am using t-cost and t-val. So when I am uh, in the theorem proving mode and I want to prove fancy properties, like the ins uh, like sorting a sorted list is has exactly like cost length minus one, then I need to open up my definitions and to do this, I need uh, the constructors. Uh, but what if you, for example, can't, so uh, if, if you uh, are able to create uh, a new instance of uh, T only by applying the combination, not uh, you, uh, if you, for example, hide a comment, will it solve uh, the problem of uh, unsafe um, creation of instance? Yeah, I think that would solve it. I think that is a good idea. What? It's no longer a mono. Since I am exporting it. It is a mono, but I don't have like the abstraction. The mono if I export the tick definition, I don't have the monadic abstraction of the resources. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yes. You can export only the records without exporting the constructs, right? I can export only what? Only the records, the value and the cost. But then I can fake it. I can take a ticked value and I can go and update the t cost if I have the, uh, the records. Do the updates only with the uh, applicative and phonetic. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be ideal to not export anything and only export the methods of the tick. But then the problem is that when I do this like proof style, I I need um, the exact definition of the tick. <laughs> 
I mean, the one solution is like to have a, a checker that says like, if you are r defining non-proofs, then you cannot use the record or the tick that type. Yes. Yeah. Um. Yeah, yeah, just choose. <laughs> yes. Um, this whole business of the tick feels a little bit like um, working around the limitations of what I can do inside of the comments. Uh, is that correct or do you see that differently? So, so it, it would be nice if we could shift the, this magic that we're doing with the tick into the comments as well and may, maybe completely keep the, the Haskell code itself free of, of the business and have it all inside of the I, d I cannot see that because, I mean, I don't have the syntax to express resources yeah. so inside the code. Basically, it's working around the limitations that I have inside of the solver uh, syntax, right? If, if, if I had, if I was, if the language there was strong enough, then I would probably prefer then you need to, have to it there. upload, uh, like, you need to say that every time I have an arrow, I have some information about the resources, for example. Then I think you need to complicate it more. Um, I mean, I don't see a clear way to define it without uh, lifting into a monad or having to talk about effects that I think Haskell people don't like effects. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, right now the, um, the, the resources are manually provided. Um, so yeah, if you if you automate, like if you put everything in the specifications, then you can only talk about, I guess, recursive codes or like a very specific resource, which has good and bad things. Okay, so this was the last question. Maybe we can take the remaining questions to the coffee break. Um, yeah. Thank you again Thank you. very much.